My name is Fong Ho. I work here at the State College of Florida as the Chief Information Officer. And I'm also serving with my friend, Dr. Richard Allett, as the co-chairs for the local venue of the China Town Hall annual event. So welcome. To those of you who've been to the China Town Hall event before, welcome back. And we thank you for your continuous support. To our new friends who are here for the first time, and the China Town Hall is an annual event hosted nationally by the National Committee on United States and China Relations, which promotes the understanding and the cooperation between the United States and China, and in the belief that the, the better relations between China and the United States serve a vital American and world interest. And this is the seventh China Town Hall event and the third consecutive year that the State of College has hosted the event. So very interesting that every year we try to uh, provide some taste of China. And interesting enough that uh, in the first year that on our menu, we provided the sweet and the sour chicken or uh, General Chow's chicken, as well as fortune cookies. And many of you recognize that neither of these were real authentic Chinese food, but they were well enjoyed it. So last year, we went a step further, and we ordered from a local Chinese restaurant some mini hot dogs. <laughs> Very authentic. And well, they all run like a hot dogs. And uh, by the time when I get a chance to go back, and uh, they're all gone. So uh, this year, we decided to order from a very popular local Chinese restaurant, the Yami House. I hope uh, many of you have, uh, yeah. And they serve really authentic uh, 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 Chinese uh, dim sum, and hopefully you, you enjoyed it. So uh, I do want to mention, though, tonight's event is underwritten uh, by uh, this Champion Solutions Group who sponsored the event. And I would also like to thank uh, SCF uh, Community, uh, the Corporate and Community Development, as well as the staff uh, who helped uh, organize the event. So uh, please join me, give them a round of applause. Thank you. <laughs> now it is my honor to introduce our college president, Dr. Carol Prosfield. And Dr. Prosfield, is a leader in higher education who truly understands the value of community service. And ever since she became the president of the State College of, of Florida, she has advocated strongly about community services, including the China Town Hall, for which we are all grateful. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Prosfeld, the president of State College of Florida. Let me welcome you to the State College of Florida Lakewood Ranch campus. This is our newest campus and celebrated its 10th anniversary about a month ago. That's one of three. We have two 100 acre campuses, one in Bradenton and one in Venice. But again, this is our newest. This is our campus that's really focused on corporate and community development and um, our nursing program. So one of these days, if you're in town and you have a moment, you might want to go to the building next door and familiarize yourself with our human patient simulators. Fascinating technology. We even have a simulator that gives birth. And I understand we had about eight births uh, last week. So. Um, <laughs> It's a wonderful resource that is available for our nursing students, also um, the medical students from LECOM, and we make it available for professional development as well. As the area's first and largest public higher education institution, I look forward to the opportunities like this 
to welcome people to our institution and to celebrate the importance of sharing information, of learning, and hopefully creating some meaningful dialogue about things that are important to us as citizens of this area, and more importantly, citizens of the world. So thank you again for coming. It's a pleasure to be able to host this, and I hope we will be able to do it for many years to come. Before I leave, I would just like to let our speaker know that I did bring some memorabilia of the State College of Florida for you to take with you when you leave. I can't be here at the end, so I'm going to give it to you now and say in advance, thank you very much. You Sincerely so much. appreciate you being here. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. <laughs> this, this presumes that I earn it later, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Pope. So now next, uh, and, uh, I'd like uh, my uh, co-chair, Dr. Richard Allen, uh, to uh, come on and introduce our uh, speaker. Dr. Allen. <coughs> Good evening. I'd like to welcome you all here. And the first thing I'd like to do is to really thank State College of Florida to, for uh, hosting this China Town Hall venue every year. It's been appreciated. The National Committee of the United States U.S. Relationships um, was formed in 1966. It's a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization. And as uh, Fang told you, it's really to promote understanding of China, both the people in our country and China. Uh, tonight, I have the pleasure of introducing Kevin Nealon, <clears throat> the principal of Scarcroft Group. Kevin's involvement in um, China relationships began long before we had any formal relationships with China. Uh, Kevin's a graduate of uh, University of Michigan. He was a student of a China scholar, Ox uh, Michael Oxberg who was uh, on President Carter's Senior Director of National Security Council and architect of U.S.-China relationships. Um, following that, Kevin moved on and subsequently worked with the author that actually wrote the uh, legislation for those relationships, and that was <laughs> Senator, Senate Majority Leader Robert Byrd. For the past 12 years, he's been with the Sawcroft Group uh, advising Brent Sawcroft the person who was widely regarded as the person who reinvented, re reanalyzed our, our China relations after the Tiananmen Square incident. Um, Kevin's a Fulbright scholar uh, in uh, international law, Chinese law, and he was one of the first groups, that, he was with the first group that came back, got back into China after Tiananmen. Uh, Kevin has met privately <laughs> with all the leaders of China. Uh, leadership groups, and um, has, has consulted with major companies in this country. And in fact, he's talked to the companies that made the largest investments in China. He worked with uh, Chrysler's uh, Beijing Jeep Venture, Motorola Corporation, million dollar investment into China. And he also, with the landmark, IBM Lenvo deal. With that introduction, I'm going to turn it over to Kevin to speak. And we'll have questions and answers at the end of the speech. Kevin, you'll handle that, right? Dr. Elliott, thank you so much for that uh, very gracious introduction. Uh, your, uh, your long involvement in China makes it a special privilege uh, for me to be here. And uh, uh, President Postfeld, let me assure you, whatever else happens, there will be no giving birth in any part of this, uh, of this exercise. Uh, this is a beautiful facility. You, you take great pride in this, I'm sure. And uh, for those of us who do part-time gigs at, uh, at universities, you walk into a, a brand spanking new setting in a brand new LED building, LED building like this, and I, my reaction is, ungenerously envy. Let me just say that. Go on the record. Uh, it's a lovely facility. And thank you all 
for coming. The National Committee does, does great work in, in pulling these discussions together, and I do want it to be a dialogue, so I'm going to try to edit myself back uh, and, and resist the Washington temptation uh, to just listen to the rich sounds of your own voice. I, the work I've been asked to do today is to characterize the changes underway uh, in the political and business environment in China a bit, and this is obviously, it's, uh, uh, President, it's, it's, it's a little too long for a graduate course, but I think we can do it in about, in about 40 minutes uh, if we try. Um, to talk about how Florida, and, and some of you might be able to take advantage of some of the changes underway, uh, and discuss some of the policy issues for, for investors, but then more broadly, uh, to describe uh, what these changes mean for Florida and the U.S. business environment. Uh, and I'm going to focus more on the economic side uh, because that's, that's really what I know best. Um, looking at Florida exports, I got to tell you, I, I, I uh, really was, uh, have some modesty enforced on me uh, about what I can tell anyone in Florida about doing business with China. Uh, China ranks fourth in the world as an export destination for products just from the Sarasota area, from exports here, both goods and services. Uh, Florida exports to China overall uh, about double what you did just a decade ago. That's really good. You see the trend line otherwise is going the other direction. Um, you guys might teach us a thing or two up in Washington. You're, you now have sales of over $1.3 billion a year, exports from Florida and goods and services. Keep it up. Do more. I think it's fantastic. Um, I'd have to begin in, in trying to give a context for what we're going to say tonight with, with saying that what's good and bad about the Chinese economic reality now has got to be measured against uh, the recent past. And as a kind of thought experiment, um, imagine the reaction I would have got as a junior foreign service officer back in 1980. Uh, I was an economic officer. If I walked in to the Secretary of State, first of all, not a chance. They, you know, you, you don't just do that. That's seventh floor. They got guards and stuff. That's not going to happen. But if I'd have found my way up there and told them that I had a plan that would make the survival of the Chinese Communist Party totally reliant on China's increasing exposure to external markets, that uh, I would, I would make that plan reliant on annual growth at or near double digits in China, annual uh, uh, economic growth. And the best part of the plan was increasing the personal earnings of a rising middle class in a way that has never been seen in economic history. Now, in the State Department, the corridors, Henry Kissinger used to got lo get lost all the time, so he had the corridors painted, the, 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 the mythic story is, I don't know where I am. One's purple, one's blue, one's yellow. Um, this thing isn't being recorded by any chances. Um, the, the, the medical corridor was yellow and white striped. I can guarantee you if I had preferred that plan to my bosses in 1980, I would have been at the yellow and white striped corridor in no time at all for evaluation. Uh, Keep in mind, in 1980, seven out of ten Chinese lived in the countryside, many in abject poverty. By some measures, there were more people living in caves in China in 1980 than single-family homes, and the average per capita GDP was, anybody want to guess? 1980 was $193 a year. That compares with uh, currently about $6,000. Uh, among China's largest exports, to the U.S. in 1980, swizzle sticks and Barbie dolls. You can't make this stuff up. As opposed, oh, and fireworks. Uh, as opposed to iPads and computers. Total annual sales to the U.S. in 1980, total annual exports, were under $4 billion. That's about what we trade, uh, about what comes over here now in a month. And U.S. exports to China now are up 468% over that time. Uh, since they joined the WTO, making it now the third largest purchaser in the world of U.S. goods. We hear a lot about the negative side of the economic story, and it, it is uh, doubtless uh, exquisitely complicated, and we'll talk about some of that. Uh, but um, you do have to keep in mind where we came from and not, not such a very long time ago. My point simply is we need to start our, uh, our analysis, I think, by acknowledging that we're dealing in a lot of ways you know, in terms of how you approach the China problem set, 
We're dealing with the artifacts of success, not the artifacts of failure in managing China's rise. Uh, ironically, both government and private companies are often better, in my experience, and more adaptive at managing and dealing with adversity than they are with dealing with success. Think about your own experience in business uh, and, and those of you who are doctors in medical practice. Some of the same habits of mind obtain, I think. Uh, if you don't believe me, ask Steve Ballmer. I understand he's having a bad couple of weeks at Microsoft. Okay, let's agree that China's growth is the great transformational economic story of the past 50 years. But like any other good story, the plot line isn't linear, is it? Uh, the U.S.-China Business Council, which if you haven't been to their website and tooled around it, they do a, just a great job. They're a great resource, and I recommend, resource and I recommend them to you. They recently described some of the challenges that American businesses are now facing as this new Chinese government, this fourth generation of leaders, uh, comes onto the scene for foreign investment and trade. And, and they're likely to prove as consequential, as, as difficult to deal with uh, as any economic policy problems for the U.S. in the past two decades, I think. Uh, these include what? Well, managing, for the Chinese, managing the uncertainties associated with a slowdown in the Chinese economy. Everybody's a hero when the numbers are going that way. Um, I, and to be clear, our firm, and I don't believe, uh, I don't subscribe to the China collapse that's been prophesied, though I admit that managing deceleration right about now is going to include a lot of unintended risks that Chinese leaders uh, are, are, are trying to get their, their, their minds and their policies around. A second issue is the rising concerns about barriers to foreign investment, uh, which is what my clients uh, worry about. Uh, and changing views about the role of foreign investment among the Chinese leaders. They've had this uninterrupted period where uh, everyone wanted to come to China. That is changing. It's qualitatively changing. We'll talk more about that later. Um, also, you know, the new paradigm is narrowing profit margins, both because of rising input costs in China. It isn't just China cheap anymore, especially labor costs, which have come up substantially. Uh, but also because of downward pressure and the commoditization, this is global, it's not just China, the commoditization of everything from semiconductors to shoes, as well as increased pressures from imports from even lower wage countries in the region. We've seen very significant moves of textile production, for instance, to Vietnam and other places in Southeast Asia uh, to the detriment of China. I, I would add two other factors, I think, that are affecting China's, uh, Chinese investment. The first of these is competition for high quality people. Yeah, I know, that seems a little ridiculous in a country of 1.3 pe billion people, but, but hear me out. You, you read all these breathless reports in American press about how many tens and hundreds of thousands of Chinese engineers and scientists are graduating, coming onto the markets, and, and you know, the linear assumption is that makes China so much more competitive. I have to tell you, working with U.S. companies that are invested there, many of these folks are simply not world-class employees. And this creates an enormous policy problem for the Chinese government. Several years ago, my, uh, my former boss, when I was a Fulbright professor there, the, the Jawe, the State Education Commission, admitted that a third, one-third of all Chinese engineering graduates from universities were unemployed, and here's the bad part, unemployable. They simply didn't have the skill set. This is a you know, this is a trope we catch ourselves in here about the quality of American education, uh, but imagine a third of engineering graduates uh, being unemployable. They simply didn't have the necessary skills, and they certainly weren't internationally competitive. The other factors complicating China investment now, uh, well, there's a long list. Regulatory uncertainty, intellectual property theft, and you've seen this, it's becoming a, a significant issue. Cybersecurity, which doesn't just relate to high tech, it starts to infect uh, all kinds of, of investment decisions. And I'll say more about these in the question time if, if, uh, if our time allows. I can't hope today to give um, each of you a, a roadmap for uh, you know, the changes in the Chinese business environment. It'd be extremely presumptuous. Uh, but we've got a new government coming in there that's just started. They'll be around for at least five years. Uh, and so let me try to employ a classic Chinese device, uh, an organizing principle, a slogan. Uh, I will give you two don'ts and two do's. Um, we could do this in bad Mandarin, but I'll resist the temptation. Uh, first, I think when you're looking at investment in China, 
don't look for yesterday's deal. Now, now what do I mean by that? Since the beginning of economic liberalization in 1989, foreign investors, people who came to China to do things, to make money, um, really employed a very simple formula for success. They thought to trade technology and capital flows for a low wage production base and access to local market share. Now that last part became very dicey for them. Uh, does anyone know how much foreign exchange China now holds? Do you have an idea how much of other people's money the Chinese banking system holds? Wild guess. Three trillion. If you're going to get it exactly right, why am I even here? That's exactly correct. Three point four trillion. Um, yes, indeed. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that was not planted. Let me assure you. Okay, and 1.3 billion of it is in dollars, mostly sitting four blocks from my office, which is troubling to me, uh, in, in the Federal Reserve Building. So as the markets say, cash is trash in China. Uh, the country with the highest per capita personal savings in the world does not need our inbound investment. Thank you very much. They have money. Uh, for those of us who worked on those issues for the last two decades, I gotta tell you, everything's become harder. If they don't need money, um, it's kind of like, you remember Texas Governor Ann Richards? Uh, she had that famous quote, it's, you're born on third base and, and behaving as if you'd hit a triple. Uh, well, that's, that's no longer the case. You can't engage in that kind of conceit if you're an American uh, company or an investor. Uh, co American companies in that respect may have, some of them may have missed the blue light special, uh, but I submit that's actually kind of liberating in a sense. Uh, as you look at forms of doing business in China, joint ventures, distributorships, or just straight sales. Your choices aren't constrained anymore by some craven need just to catch the inbound wave. The wave, guys, is going the other way. Uh, it's going out, not in. Uh, while still an emerging market, I, we look at China, especially at second and third tier cities where there's a lot of activity, it, it does face enormous competition now from other countries. There are more shoes now made in Indonesia, there are more textile production is growing faster in Vietnam. And as I said at the outset, you know, labor cost, energy pricing, and taxes, some of which disfavor foreign investment, all play a role. Let me add here one other notion that comes up a lot in our conversations with uh, our American clients. As, as a corollary, we can pick it up in the Q&A. Any foreign company has got to recognize that at some point, Chinese regulators could decide to make it a target. You may have seen in the papers recently stories about Chinese authorities targeting foreign pharmaceutical firms, milk producers, uh, calling them out for price setting and monopoly behavior and corrupt practices, uh, even, of course, as the Chinese firms are guilty of exactly the same thing. Uh, in advising investors, uh, it's always wise, I think, to recognize something inevitably is going to go wrong in some part of the deal. Um, it, it, and they're going to look for ways, the Chinese government is going to look for ways to advantage domestic firms at the expense of foreign ones. It may also be a way to use a Chinese proverb of uh, killing a chicken to scare a hundred monkeys. That is sending a signal to, you know, going after domestic uh, uh, foreign firms in order to let domestic firms know they too need to clean up their act, they need to behave better. It's easier to make an example out of the foreigners. Okay, my second don't is um, don't imagine, and I have the, uh, I'm in a 12 point program for lawyers. I didn't practice law today and I hope not to practice tomorrow. However, um, it's really important that you don't imagine you're a Chinese lawyer. It's bad enough imagining you're an American lawyer. Uh, this is a mistake uh, both lawyers and non-lawyers looking at the China market make. Now what do I mean? Uh, you know, an, an attorney looks at a deal in terms of answering commercial law questions that relate to the proposal documents, the tax features, and uh, other aspects of organic features of how you put the deal together, M&As, uh, joint ventures, what have you. Fair enough, that's fine, that's what you're allowed to do. Um, and we may have an investment bank or an auditing firm, hopefully, if you're going in, one with strong Chinese capability and presence and, and, and employees, and they start providing the inbound investor, the American investor, with guidance about listing requirements or tax law. This is a process, and I've been through it probably 200 times, where 
uh, American firms start to kid themselves into thinking, hey, they know what these issues are about and they have them covered. And in the recent past, the other problem that's been a constraint, a capacity constraint, is Chinese law firms, frankly, were not very good. Um, they were uh, of questionable quality. It was a lot easier to go with your American law firm or with a Hong Kong law firm who could tell you a story about how they, they know how things are done in China. Um, that's not a good idea anymore. If you're going into China, you need to get authentic Chinese legal guidance. And there are world-class law firms that are doing business uh, now. You, you can identify them. There are a growing number of competent firms. I can say more about that later. I, I, let me get to the do's. I've done the don'ts here. The first do is a corollary of the last don't really, and it's do become familiar with government policy because it's a feedback loop that for all the hand-wringing about how intrusive our government is in so many investment decisions, uh, you just can't begin to compare it to China. When dealing with a command economy, you may think that guidance is obvious, but I can assure you uh, it's not the, 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 the instinctive response of most U.S. companies uh, when you're dealing with them uh, to tell the boss that he really needs to read the Chinese Communist Party's five-year plan. That is not just a silly notion. It's actually, uh, it, it's kind of surprising. Uh, it, it's important to understand that there's a superficial sense, and I, I stress superficial, in which the Chinese system is actually amazingly transparent. They actually tell you a lot of what they, what they, no kidding, intend to do. Uh, and they certainly reveal their priorities through these policy documents. To a first order, the central government and provincial authorities publish their goals. And this is not like something that, you know, Pinellas County comes out with. This actually happens and, and controls the objective reality. The behavior of Chinese officials, if you want to you dope this out and think, well, why, why would they, why are these planning exercises so important to them? Over 60% of your job evaluation, think about this, for those of you who have retired, bless you, um, but, but just remember what it was like if 60% of your job evaluation related to how you promoted stability. My wife hates this joke. The Chinese word for stability is wen ding. And I always say it's not wen ding, it's another. Um, What's stability? Uh, among other things, it's adherence to party guidelines. So the, e the economic plans that they publish, it isn't just aspirational. It, it isn't just something that lays out there the way, I don't know, something from the, you know, the Department of Energy in the U.S. Uh, is just a mark on the wall. Um, it, it's actually a work program for the areas that it covers, and you can learn a lot by, by uh, reading it and, and understanding uh, what's going on. And if you think such declarations are just notional, you know, it's just government speak, I can tell you a client of ours had a terrific technology that would have significantly reduced pollution in a Chinese industry uh, that was ruining water quality and spewing out poison into Chinese rivers. China boasts, by the way, seven out of the ten most polluted rivers in the world. You can't do that by accident. You actually have to work hard to do that. Um, so along comes this American company, and um, the technology, they're willing to transfer totally, uh, and it would massively clean up this entire industry. How can this be a bad idea? It's a great idea. No, it's actually a lousy idea because government policy in China was to shut down that they thought the activity itself was so inherently polluting, thermally polluting and, and uh, chemically polluting, that you know where it should be made? Someplace not called China. So that whole activity was actually redlined. They just put it in a box and said, this is a valuable product. Someone else should make it and ruin their environment. End of story. Uh, they just didn't want to bear the costs, uh, the societal costs in China of making that product. Um, let me move on. The second do is a do recognize that in China, everything, and I mean everything is political, uh, especially if you're told that it's just a matter of law or a matter of market realities or a matter of pricing. If you hit any one of those words, it's political. It's inherently political. Um, what does this mean? Well, as a protective device, it means that any exposure in China, any business you're doing there, requires you develop an appropriate approach to government relations. Uh, and to be clear, government means the party. Um, the, the, the card that you have that you're given, uh, and I can't tell you how many times this happened. I had one client walk into a meeting with a group of people, 
And there was a fellow in a gumbo jacket, a Mao jacket. Nobody wears Mao jackets. It's highly uncool. Um, and he sat there through the entire joint venture negotiation, never said a word, um, because there were people who had name cards that said they were the president of the company and they were the, uh, the, the boss of this, that, the other thing. The chap in the gumbo jacket, the Mao jacket, um, he was the party secretary of the company. And the other folks, they were just talking. It was, it, you know, knock yourself out, guys. But here was the, here was the uh, as, as George Bush would say, the decider fire. This was the guy who actually made the, uh, the consequential choices. Um, how, do you, how do you break into that if you're, if you're looking at investment in China? Well, there are organizations like the U.S. China Business Council and, and the Foreign Commercial Service. As a former Foreign Service officer, I've got to say, these folks do a superb job if you're, if you're looking at outbound investment in China. The embassy of the consulate can do enormous good in guiding you through that thicket. Now, as we're meeting today, and I mean literally now, there are six working groups on the economy in China that are finalizing their final report to be handed around early November, we don't know, know quite when, uh, at the party plenum. Their conclusions on everything from financial market liberalization to tax policy to state enterprise reform is going to shape the economic landscape for the next five years. Um, I mean, if you ask me, what are we looking at? What is my firm looking at? We advise U.S. companies. Um, well, uh, what are the bellwethers that we think are significant? Well, look at action. It's sort of like here in a weird way. Look at action or inaction on tax reform as some kind of indication of how serious the Chinese are, uh, their depth of commitment to real deep societal economic reforms. They haven't done much in the, in the tax reform area for quite a few years. The outcome of the party plenum, we think, is going to inform thinking on what's possible for foreign investors and what the political landscape is going to be like for the near term. Uh, look at the reporting that comes out of it, just you know, stuff you see in the Wall Street Journal and online. Um, and um, uh, look for then probably December or uh, early, early in the new year, uh, a thing called the Party Work Conference. I know this sounds like just gobbledygook, but these documents actually will give you the, the best insight into what the Chinese are up to and what they intend in the economic space. I, a brief final thought on something I think in South Florida is particularly important, and that is Chinese investment here. I said at the outset that Chinese growth was the big economic story of the last few decades. Well, if the past is prologue, we look at the Japan experience of the 80s, and I got to tell you, I worked on Capitol Hill uh, for that at that time, for the, uh, as, as uh, Dr. Elliott said, for the then Senate Majority Leader. And, and, you know, the terms of debate were, shall we say, not elevated. We had members of Congress, not, not that it is now, we had members of Congress, uh, I don't know if you recall this, uh, standing on top of Japanese cars and slashing them, uh, smashing them with sledgehammers. That would, you know, that, um, I, I don't even know where to go with that. Uh, we're, we're, not, we're, not, we're not there uh, with, with China, though we've got a lot of neuralgia on trade issues. Um, but uh, China has, as we said, a, a trillion uh, dollars. They're destined to recycle those dollars. The dollars are in dollars. They're coming back here. They're not going to convert them into three different currencies. And you know what? This is, if you look at Europe, if you look at Latin America, and even if you look at the rest of Asia, this is a really good market in a whole lot of ways. I know it's hard for us in real time to imagine that, and Congress seems to try to put a lie to that uh, on a regular basis, but, but still and yet. Uh, the days for the Chinese of, and this is what they've been doing, essentially, they've been parking the trillion dollars in T-bills. I mean, literally, it's, it's been sitting four blocks from my office at the Fed, at least electronically. Um, we've seen some iconic deals already, and they're kind of interesting, like uh, the Smithfield uh, purchase, uh, very interesting, and Wanda, a theater company, purchasing uh, AMC's assets. I'm certain we're going to see more. I think it's going to be a quali I hope it's going to be a qualitatively different debate than, than what we saw with uh, Japan when I was working on Capitol Hill in the 80s. We discovered a couple things in that conversation as we got more and more neuralgic about the Japanese buying things. Here's one of the things we discovered. Rockefeller Center, it was not on wheels. They couldn't take it anywhere. They owned it. They paid three times, bless their hearts, they paid, paid three times the market price uh, for Rockefeller Center. 
I want buyers like that in my market. I, I really do. I, you know, I, 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 want, I, want, I want folks who overvalue American assets here. I don't think the Chinese will, uh, uh, will make that, quite that mistake. Uh, they're not condemned to repeat the Japan mistakes. Uh, they also uh, seem to be, in conversations I've had with people on the buy side in China, um, they're aware of history. Right? Um, uh, Chinese do history, as, as uh, Dr. Elliott can tell you. It's, uh, it's an important part of, the, uh, of, uh, of their worldview. So I don't think they're going to pay multiples for Pebble Beach or much of anything else. Um, and we're going to see problem areas, of course. We're going to see sensitive sectors like telecommunications and, or, that are going to provoke a, a regulatory response, and for good reason. There, there are authentic security issues there. I don't mean to make light of any of those. Uh, but keep in mind that the, the CFIUS, CFIUS process, you're going to hear more about that, for regulating foreign investment is limited, and it starts with a presumption, if anyone you know, approaches you about deals, the, the U.S. government's regulatory presumption is that this is America, it's, it's for sale, you know, uh, that, that basically all, most all assets, uh, the, the unfettered presumption is, is most everything's for sale. Uh, for the first time in its history, when I try to understand uh, how adaptive government is and, and what it's doing or not doing with, uh, uh, with opportunities, I look at how it's structured, you know, I, I don't read the press releases, that's all nonsense. What, what matters is, how is it organizing itself? And it's interesting to me. The Commerce Department, uh, which was tasked solely for most of my life with selling U.S. products abroad, has an office now dedicated to supporting investment in the United States. Interesting idea. Bring the money here. It's called Select USA. Um, if you're working with a, an American client and a potential buyer, start talking to local and state governments. My experience with all the terrible things that happened with Japan, uh, with the, the reaction to Japanese investment here, is a lot of this was simply lack of information. And it, frankly, the Japanese uh, handled a great deal of it uh, very poorly. And, and I mentioned CFIUS, the uh, Committee on Foreign Investment in the US, uh, concerns. I got to tell you, uh, you look at the totality of investments in the United States, Currently, and I would say for the future, far less than 1%, I mean a lot less than 1%, trigger CFIUS sensitivities or sensitive sectors or, or uh, otherwise require government review. And by the way, the interesting thing about that is um, I learned early on law school that, that anything which is itself the product of negotiation is negotiable. My wife knows this even when she walks into Nordstrom's and, you know, the shoe department. Um, uh, the, the, the price on the shoes was arrived at by negotiation, and, and sometimes it embarrasses me, but it, these negotiations can be reactivated. Well, well so too, um, um, Treasury, the other government agencies that are looking at uh, genuine, I don't mean to make light of them, real security concerns, uh, they can be approached. So, you know, those of you who might be involved in any China inbound investment, go to them early and start talking to them. Um, and, and educate them, uh, explore the issues with them, understand what their concerns as regulators are. They aren't all monsters, believe it or not. Um, in conclusion, uh, let me repeat that the, the game board on which we've been playing out a lot of the U.S.-China relation, commercial relationship especially is complicated, and I'll tell you, it's condemned to become more so with the passage of time. That's the nature of complex systems, right? It's also the nature of success. Um, and, and deepening great power relationships um, that we're, we're now facing, uh, where a country is neither a friend nor an enemy. Um, I can only guarantee you that uh, if, if you've got a pile of money and you're running a company or an, a, a part of a company and you want to be in China in the worst way, you will. You'll absolutely be there in the worst way. So, so uh, uh, be <laughs> circumspect about that. Uh, we have. Time for questions, I think. So my question has to do with that. So do you agree with that analysis that, um, that the foreign pharmaceutical companies were targeted specifically in order to um, give preferential treatment to the domestic companies? Do you think it's part of the government policy now, or what's your Well, as we say in China, this is no accident, comrade. Um, yeah, I do. Um, and um, to be clear, the, the intent um, has to be looked at in, and I, I don't want to, this is a bit of a caricature. Uh, this is not entirely different 
than the regulatory behavior in the United States. It, some of it becomes experimentation. Uh, the, the motives are very different. Let me be clear about that. I, I think the, uh, the Chinese are uh, turned a corner several years ago, mm, two, three, five, uh, in, in their view of foreign investment. And it, you, know, you might notice that number is roughly coincident with the financial crisis. Um, suddenly, well, the, the, the phrase that got thrown in my face a lot was, uh, the teacher has, has, uh, has not learned the lesson. Uh, you know, if you guys were so smart, uh, why are you in the pickle you're in? Um, it, it, but, I, but I would submit it's cyclical. You've, I've seen it in other countries where you go from a period of extraordinary buildup of foreign investment to a much more selective uh, uh, and, and purposive, and, and in their case, um, insidiously, I think, policy-directed view of the role of foreigners in the economy. And, and I wasn't just being glib when I made the comment about killing a chicken to scare 100 monkeys. You know, it's easier to make an example out of a foreign firm. Um, uh, when I look at some of the practices, and I've been involved in, in transactions and purchases and sales of Chinese pharmaceutical companies, and I got to tell you, you know, you cannot compare quality control issues in most of the U.S. and international world-class pharmaceutical industry with much of what had gone on in the homegrown Chinese industry. It, you know this well. Um, why did they do it? Yeah, I think they did it to make examples. I think they also did it to build national champions. Um, they're still rationalizing their pharmaceutical sector. You got 8,000 companies in China making pharmaceutical products. That makes no sense whatsoever. Uh, and you folks were bringing world-class technology, and in a lot of cases, the companies, uh, at least some of the ones I dealt with, were willing to transfer whole, uh, just whole piece, that technology to China. A lot of the IP issues uh, were, uh, were, were th that we associate with, with, uh, with high tech and others. Uh, you guys in the pharmaceutical uh, industry have a very different mindset. I, and, and as a business person, I had, took me a while to, to acclimate to this. You are, forgive me, you're Wiley Coyote running across the bridge as the bridge is collapsing behind you. And you run faster in the belief that, you know, you can run faster in this cartoon and get to the other side th faster than anybody else. You, you guys depend, tell me if you think this is wrong, you depend on the next big thing and on your own creative energy to keep the, 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 the sort of returns that we've all come to expect from the world's top pharmaceutical companies. Well, um, you know, that business model in China uh, profoundly threatens uh, a sclerotic 8,000 member industry. Uh, and it also does something a lot more elemental. And by the way, if you want to, you know, when you do sort of China risk analysis, and forgive me for going on about this, but it, it, it touches something that's close to the bone for me. If you want to look at success or failure over the next five years of the current Chinese, the new Chinese regime, look at health policy. You know, uh, look at their ability to deliver world-class health care. You know, uh, and, and forgive, the, uh, forgive the comparison, but Cuba, you know, another erstwhile communist regime has made delivery of goods, healthcare goods and services, basically one of the few uh, uh, pieces of, I know I'm in dangerous water, almost literally down in, in, in South Florida talking about Cuba, but uh, you know, the, delivering those kinds of goods and services, that's become a metric for the whole bloody regime. Well, you know, if you were to apply that metric to China, it would be a bitter disappointment. What you guys have brought and what you offer is profoundly threatening. And they've got to either reorient the whole of their healthcare system, and it's going to have to do, be something very profound and very bold. You know, they do things incrementally. That's, that they're very good at, at, at incrementalism, and I admire that. Um, you know the famous story about uh, the French president telling uh, Joe and Lai that, uh, uh, let me see if I can remember the whole story, um, uh, that uh, you know, we, we too are a revolutionary people. We admire uh, revolution and uh, uh, Cho and uh, you know, this, is, this is the origin of French society. And Cho and Lai said, yes, the French Revolution. Difficult to tell how that's turned out yet, isn't it? 
you know, the, they, they admire revolution, but they, they, they need it on their own terms, which, which generally means incrementalism in a long, long time. That's a very long-winded answer. What, what I would say is uh, they face health policy choices, central to which is the future of their pharmaceutical industry, that they can no longer defer. The answers to the questions you were trying to ask while you were working there I think are going to be available in the next two or three years, and they will succeed or fail in that transformation, but it's going to be obvious and dramatic. And if they don't take the best practices that the international industry has, um, I will tell you this, uh, about a year and a half, two years ago, I was with my boss in a car, and one of the, one of the those of you who have been to China, among these strange things in Beijing in particular is that you may not make a left turn. Think about that. It's kind of the ideological overlay. You can't turn left. Uh, it's a communist country. I thought we all turned. Um, but so in order to get around Tiananmen Square, we're making a series of right-hand turns past uh, Number Four Army Hospital, and there are probably 100, maybe 150 people who, forgive me, look like a lot of you, who are retired people. And they're out on the street with signs in English and Chinese that say, I am not served. Where is my health care? I mean, boy, you know, don't get old people mad, right? I mean, that's, that, you want to undermine your legitimacy. So, you know, delivering health care goods and services, no one in the current, the new leadership is confused. That's going to be a, a, a significant metric of success or failure. And they're not going to be able to continue to do what they've done with pharmaceuticals. Um, that's a really long-winded answer. Uh, promise, no, no other answer will be that long. You know, um, the, the, we're in the very early days of the Xi Jinping regime. I, um, I'm deeply conflicted about what I see so far. I, I, mean, I find it, very, honestly, very confusing. Um, there are features, um, and I was, there, I was there two weeks ago, talking to a friend with, um, uh, who's one of the people, you know, they're, they're these sort of go-to people in our society and theirs who, uh, uh, you know, are, are deeply aware of what the policy debates are. Uh, there aren't a whole lot of them, uh, surprisingly. But uh, th this guy has, uh, he has been a friend of uh, nearly three decades, and he seldom gets it wrong. But uh, he was very reserved in, in trying to answer a version of that question that I threw at him. Uh, uh, he looked at some of the things that's been going on on the political front lately, and there's no other word for it. They look unconfident. They do not look like, you know, off to a crisp start. We're running things. Um, they're pretty repressive. Uh, they're pretty retrograde. Um, there's a cast back to some of the rhetoric of, of the 80s, some stuff that I recognize. Having been in China, I was a Fulbright professor. I went back with the first group, uh, as Dr. Elliott mentioned, immediately after Tiananmen. Uh, that was the second worst job in China. The worst job was my wife's job. She was a reporter, uh, an American reporter. So, um, uh, you know, um, it was never, I never had to worry about her personal safety because she had about like two dozen guys with crew cuts following her all the time. I, I, she could go anywhere. She's immune. Um, but um, I look at the incoming regime. I've seen, I guess, like four of these transitions. And I asked my boss, General Scowcroft, you know, he's, eh, who's, who's, uh, who's met him privately and talked with him. Um, and he said, you know, um, it's, it's not old wine in a new bottle. Uh, the guy is uh, a world-class intellect, no doubt, no question. Now, that's, a, that's almost, uh, that's almost uh, condescending, isn't it? I mean, the top 0.0001% of 1.3 billion people is a really smart group of people, let's, let's stipulate. Um, but where he's going with some of the political, uh, the, the non-reforms, um, you know, and the the, uh, the roll-up of uh, um, of uh, uh, some of the some of the dissidents, or and uh, 
it, it, it is, to me, it looks unconfident. And I'm sure I'm looking through the wrong end of the telescope. Every time you kind of think you need appropriate modesty if you worked on China for the better part of three decades, you know, every time you think you've got it sussed out, you probably don't. Uh, Chinese friends will look at you when, you when you think you've got the key to a particular issue and, and, and they, 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 their, their eyes will drop a little bit and they go, don't know. you don't understand China. And I don't understand China after 30 years. But um, I, I'd say this group is, uh, is setting the stage uh, in a way that looks rather unconfident to me as an outsider, that looks, uh, uh, they, they, they come to power at a moment, not a maximal risk. I mean, uh, they're not even dealing with the economic instability that Zhu Rongji was back uh, in, in, the, in the 90s. This is a pretty good, they, they've been dealt a pretty good um, uh, deck of cards. And, and to be clear, the current leadership is not vastly different from the guys who just left. I promised myself I'd edit these answers. I'm not doing a very good job. Um, but uh, all to say, um, I don't know how successful they're going to be. And... Um, I, I mean, I, I, none of us really actually wish them failure, right? Let's be clear about that. Uh, but some of the early moves by the administration look to me surprisingly uh, restrictive uh, and, and, frankly, somewhat unimaginative. Um, do, you, do you have a follow-up? Do you I'm think sorry. it was more towards like the promotion society, in a short way, kind of policy, which is you with Moshe Lai, which I think it is, as you said, it was a little restrictive. Do you think they're... Themselves for, I don't know, regional power That's the, 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 the positive spin on all this, and I just was up in New York where a, a, a consultant gave a presentation. I, I really respect the guy. He's very bright. He offered the view that they're doing the tough stuff up front now. They're doing the tough cop stuff. Why, in part, you may have seen this Bushy Lai incident. This was a charismatic, this guy was Huey Long. It's the only way you can explain him in American context. You know, he was, he was let's go sing patriotic songs together, y'all. Let's do that. You know, and he was a populist. Um, and, you know, there are not a lot of those in, in the gray-suited, red-tied uh, Chinese uh, apparatchik core. Uh, so they didn't know what to make of him. Um, they had the, uh, the, the trial uh, and everything. You know, there is a thesis that Xi Jinping is starting out kind of in reaction to what was this, this, uh, the excesses of this, the threat of a populist, almost Western style politician. That, that unnerved them. So they don't experiment with crazy, wacky ideas in an environment where they see risk accelerating. So, you know, all to say, I have no idea. Uh, guys, guys who I've, uh, uh, folks I have known to who are a part of the system and deep in the system. Uh, have expressed confusion and doubt to me in the last six, eight months. I'll take them at their word. If they don't know what's going on, I sure as heck am going to be modest about any, uh, any assumptions I make about uh, what's happened. Yes, sir. With pollution being such a significant factor out there at this time between the water and the air, the, the air gets the, the greatest amount, but you mentioned the water, and it's a huge concern because of all the factories that were built in, in all the wrong places. Um, how much is being done? I mean, I know from a power standpoint, you've got new coal plants coming out, new problems, but you also have a world record number of water generation uh, yeah. uh, power plants coming on. Uh, to me, it looks like the chance for him to be actually a hero to the people if he can make significant strides there. It, it, your question contains a real insight. When I was there as a Fulbright professor, you know, in 90, 91, um, the question, the thing people talked about just, you know, over dinner and, and, and chatted about, uh, you're going to laugh, was uh, shoes. Uh, you have nice shoes. I don't have nice shoes. I can't, where do you get a pair of good shoes in China? I mean, I, it was like post-war Europe where people were focused on small consumables and, you know, I just want the government to come out with a good pair of shoes. Is that so much to ask? You, you get into dinner party conversations, a little prosaic, not, not too interesting. That conversation now is about the environment. I mean, you cannot sit down with a group of Chinese intellectuals uh, or, or just Labaisheng, ordinary people, um, and not find yourself in a conversation about environmental degradation. Uh, it was there end of May. Air quality was pushing, you know, 500 parts per million. I mean, 
Um, by the way, the guy, one of my partners, Bob Goldberg, was uh, running the U.S. Embassy. He was the acting ambassador uh, when uh, he decided to, that the embassy would put on the web the embassy's air quality index, because the Chinese government, it was nebu, it was prohibited. You know, you could not get the particulate air quality. Well, Bob, you know, prosaic little foreign service officer, just to say, hey, what the heck? Let's just go crazy and put this right. And the guy is a genius. I mean, he, he is one of the quiet masters of American foreign policy who looks at small things and recognizes. Uh, so he, he, he put that on the embassy website. Drove the Chinese government insane. Now everybody in China, I'm not making this up, I, I mean, senior officials have the U.S. Embassy uh, app on their phone and go, you know, 400 parts per, oh, that's terrible, look at that, you know. Uh, that's it's, it's, it's the, the revealed word. You're right, they've got this opportunity to do really transformational things. The people in the environment ministry would tell you, we've been at this for two decades. You know, this isn't new territory for us. Um, the, the guy who was vice minister of the environment wrote a book that when I was living there was banned. I mean, he, he was, was uh, ostracized for, uh, and now he's, you know, a member of the government. Uh, so th they've taken this, they recognize it's retail politics, uh, that there is, there is no second best solution. They have to, they have to get world-class practices. Um, but against the backdrop of consumerism and in particular uh, auto production and this increasing political dynamic of rising power of the, prov of the provincial and local governments as against the federal government. You know, when I was living there, if there was pollution, and this actually happened on several occasions, a, a, a plant was exceeding uh, acceptable air quality, the government walked in and shut it down. I mean, end of story, full stop. That doesn't happen anymore. It can't happen quite like that. Because of a strange kind of democratization that's happening, the provincial and local governments are accreting more power. Uh, it's a strange kind of reverse federalism. It's purposive. They're doing it because they recognize it's, it is, in fact, the beginning of good governance. But it produces this asymmetric result in issues like environment, where I can't possibly go to my good friend, La Wu, and shut down his plant. Of course he's spewing poison into the river, but gosh, it's 8,000 jobs. You know? So that dynamic, it's authentic politics. Don't get me wrong. You know, it's it's, it's intraspace politics. Um, they, they are doing incredibly innovative things uh, in China on the environment side, uh, on clean coal technology and otherwise. Uh, but in a society of that population density and experiencing growth at that rate, um, one wonders how much of it is enough. And it's become retail politics, I was saying before. I mean, it's the kind of, it's the kind of stuff uh, that, uh, that meal conversations are about with old friends when you sit down the first three things you talk about after you talk about uh, jobs and kids um, is the environment and how bad it is. I actually had one very senior uh, official for an American company say to me on the car to the airport last trip out, she just said, I've, I've had enough, by the way. I, I can't, you know, knocking on the window of the car, she said, I can't put up with this anymore. Uh, I, 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 I want to leave. Good evening from our nation's capital to those in the eastern and central states. Good afternoon to those in the mountain states on the west coast and in Hawaii. I am Steve Orleans, president of the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations, and I am pleased to welcome audiences from 66 venues throughout the country to our seventh annual China Town Hall Local Connections National Reflections. We created China Town Hall in the belief that U.S.-China relations are the defining relationship of the 21st century, and that getting that relationship right is the key to peace and stability throughout the world. Pick up any newspaper or magazine, watch or listen to any television or radio news program, and there is a story about China or about the U.S.-China relationship. China's economic and strategic decisions now affect every corner of the United States and the world. 
We are fortunate to have with us tonight an extraordinary American, Madeleine Albright, who under President Clinton was our first female permanent representative of the United, to the United Nations and then our first female Secretary of State. She now chairs the Albright Stonebridge Group, a global strategy firm, the National Democratic Institute for International Affairs, and too many other firms to name. Her accomplishments are also too long to list, so let me only mention that last year, President Obama chose Secretary Albright to receive the nation's highest civilian honor, the Presidential Medal of Freedom, in recognition of her contributions to international peace and democracy. Before beginning, I would like to thank our partners at all 66 venues and our small but very dedicated National Committee staff, which has done a magnificent job in coordinating this complex nation nationwide event. Let me also thank our speakers, none of whom is paid. A veritable, a veritable who's who of China experts in America, they have traveled throughout the country to talk with you because they believe, as we do, that educating Americans about China will help fashion policies that are in the long-term interest of the United States. In addition, we thank the Star Foundation for funding this exciting program. Last, but certainly not least, I thank Secretary Albright for joining us today. I've had the privilege of watching Secretary Albright give talks like this throughout her career, and I know we are in for a treat today. We are now accepting questions submitted electronically from our venues. We will get to as many as we can and apologize in advance to those who, whose questions we don't have time to answer. Let me now turn the floor over to Secretary Albright. Steve, thank you very, very much. And to our friends across the country, good evening to you all. I would like to thank you officially, Steve Orleans, for that very, very warm introduction and the National Committee on United States-China Relations for inviting me to share this evening with you. I want to congratulate the National Committee for doing such a fine job in bringing together people to learn more about what I consider to be the most important bilateral relationship of this century. In many ways, the National Committee, founded six years before President Nixon's historic trip to Beijing, was very much, to quote, present at the creation. You've done so much to deepen our bilateral relationship with China over the last four decades. As we look to the future, the key question is whether the United States and China can work together to solve the world's important challenges despite different economic systems and divergent views on such matters as democracy, religious freedom, civil liberties, and the rule of law. In my view, this is certainly possible so long as we recognize our disagreements and core differences with maturity, confront our challenges directly, and have leaders on both sides that are committed to this relationship. So tonight, I'd like to share my thoughts on how current American and Chinese leaders see the relationship and what is required of us in order to build a new model of bilateral relations, which both Presidents Obama and Xi have referenced as a possible unifying goal. My own perspective on this subject extends back several decades to the mid-1970s mid when I first began working in Washington. President Carter was in the White House where I served on his national security staff. My job was to maintain good relations with Congress, an assignment that has often been compared then and now to herding cats. In that role, I accompanied a Senate delegation to China along with my mentor, the late Senator Edmund Muskie. Our goal was to persuade Congress that the time for normalized relations had come. Our countries did not know much about each other then, and we had to rely on magazines and history books for information. Some were great, but others circulated information that was inaccurate, distorted, or just plain wrong. And yet, 
By and large, American leaders kept an open mind and imagined that such a new relationship, what it would look like. The same was true for the Chinese, so we charted a new path and established formal ties in 1979. Now, almost 35 years later, that moment of connection continues to shape both our countries and the world. In my years of experience, I've learned that good relations between leaders matter a great deal. At the United Nations, I worked closely with my Chinese counterpart, Li Zhaojing, and he went on to serve as Chinese ambassador here in Washington at the same time that as I served as Secretary of State. The trust that we developed was crucial in our pursuit of bilateral cooperation. Of course, good relationships alone are not always enough. My working history with Li Zhaojing did not make it any easier for us to deal with the United States' accidental bombing of the Chinese embassy in Belgrade during the war in Kosovo. But it did serve as a valuable bedrock for enhancing engagement between our countries. I believe that overall our relationship with China today is positive and complementary. Our annual bilateral trade now exceeds $500 billion, and in June, President Obama and Xi committed to a significant and concrete goal to reduce emissions that contribute to climate change. But as in any other relationship, there have been and will continue to be stresses and challenges. The economic imbalances between our countries pose legitimate questions about the health of our relationship and recent tightening on the freedoms of journalists, lawyers, public advocates, and social media in China is very troubling. As a result, Americans continue to raise questions about China's growing influence, the imbalance in trade, controversy over currency exchange rates, and Beijing's unique and opaque political system. Whichever way our leaders choose to respond to these concerns, their policies should be based not on emotion, but reason, not on myth, but fact. There's ample opportunity to do this, as I believe we are at a crucial moment in the relationship a moment leaders on both sides recognize that we have to seize. Both countries have recently completed their respective leadership transitions. President Obama, almost a year into his second term, has already redoubled his administration's efforts to enhance our presence in Asia. Diplomatically, economically, and militarily, we must continue to rebalance to Asia. For almost 70 years, our nation has paid in both blood and treasure to guarantee peace and stability in the region, and Asia has benefited from Washington's engagement. Our agenda is simple. We want to reassure our allies by providing security and stability in the region. <clears throat> we want to maintain a reliable and credible governing architecture. We want to bolster lasting institutions where nations can resolve their differences. And we want to advance economic relationships throughout the region through the Trans-Pacific Partnership. By opening up markets, we can unleash the incredible human potential in Asia so that living standards can continue to rise. Perhaps more than many of his predecessors, President Obama has shown a personal interest in Asia, having spent part of his childhood there he has referred to himself often as America's first Pacific president. This must continue. We need to send a strong message that the United States is as much a Pacific nation as it is an Atlantic nation. And China, too, has just completed a political transition, with President Xi now at the helm. He has shown a deep interest not only in building stronger ties with the United States, but also in our country itself. I had the opportunity to meet then Vice President Xi in February 2012 when the Chinese Embassy hosted a small dinner in honor of his visit to the United States. That evening, he told us about his days in Iowa on an exchange program. He said he'd kept in touch with his hosts and fondly recalled the generosity he encountered, his love for Mark Twain, and the beauty of Muscatine at sunset. In our conversation, he appeared to be very much attuned to the needs of his domestic constituents and has since taken on populist themes to enhance his and the party's credibility with the Chinese people. 
the openness that Presidents Obama and Xi have displayed with one another and their, in their one-on-one -on -one interactions at the Sunnyland Summit in June show that our bilateral relationship is becoming not only more regularized, but also more personalized. I continue to travel to China frequently, and many of the other new senior leaders have Im been impressive. They often speak to me about the Chinese dream, a new aspiration coined by Xi himself, which supposedly aims to bring greater prosperity and comfort to a broader swath of China. I suspect that these leaders realize that for the Chinese dream to materialize, they have no choice but to work closely with the United States, for our two societies are increasingly bound together. This doesn't mean that we will always agree, and Americans will always speak out for our core values, freedom, market-based capitalism, democracy, and the advancement of a rules-based order where all nations can thrive. As chair of the National Democratic Institute, I often wrestle with these deeply profound issues. I've raised them with the Chinese during bilateral dialogues our two countries have co-hosted, including at one that brought representatives from the American Democratic and Republican parties together with their Chinese Communist Party counterparts to discuss political party development. We may have our disagreements, but dialogues such as these are important channels to make our views clear and to confront our differences. And I think that this kind of regular, frank interaction is what the two presidents had in mind when they spoke of the need to build a new model of bilateral relations at the Sunnyland Summit in June. Despite our differences, we must ask ourselves, can we work together to solve some of the thorniest bilateral and global issues of our time? Will we promote the development of international institutions and advance peace in trouble spots from Syria to the Korean Peninsula? Will we move forward with all nations to safeguard innovation and intellectual property by fighting cyber crimes and recent irritant in the relationship? Will China assume the responsibility of a global stakeholder, helping to keep the peace and upholding the rule of law around the world? Rhetorical questions are, of course, easy to ask but painful to answer, and it's always easier to recite goals than to achieve them. But if a new model of bilateral relations provides a framework for two fundamentally different nations to resolve these challenges, then perhaps it is a worthy goal for us to pursue together. So in that spirit, as we write the next chapter in our bilateral relationship, I want to close tonight by seeking some insight from the past. In many years of study and practice in diplomacy, I have learned that nothing is inevitable, not America's achievement of greatness, nor China's march toward it. The progress of history is delicate, and a nation's path through it must be constantly maintained, perfected, and reassessed. Over 40 years ago, an American president arrived in China and began a relationship that has moved the world in ways that few could have imagined. Since then, we've had seven successive U.S. administrations and all have endeavored to maintain stable relations with China, even as domestic partnership ebbed and flowed and events challenged the strength of our ties. Across the Pacific, five Chinese governments have done the same. We have seen crisis and tensions from Tiananmen to Taiwan, from commercial frictions to cyber aggressions, yet we have managed them as best we could, because being honest about these issues while finding areas ripe for bilateral cooperation are equally important to American national interests. In this moment in time, our relationship must continue to mature. Washington does not want to carry all the world's burdens and we want Beijing to assume a role in global leadership. This is something that we Americans should welcome for the benefit of our own citizens and those around the world. So with history as a source of insight, with maturity and vigilance as defining characters of actions, and with the hope of a stable and prosperous world as a guide, there's every reason to believe that we can advance this relationship for another 40 years and beyond. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Secretary Albright. I think that that talk is, reminds us why you've been such an inspirational leader to so many women and men in the United States. I'm sure I could hear the applause in all the 66 venues. Um, 
Let me use the mo moderator's prerogative and just ask one question tonight. This will be the only one I'm a I will ask, which is you said um, Washington does not want to carry all the world burdens, and we want Beijing to assume a role in global leadership. How can Beijing assume this role without usurping the American role and creating tension in kind of the policymaking community in the United States? Well, I have, from the very beginning, said that the United States is the indispensable nation. Um, I said it at the United Nations, and I said it as secretary, but there is nothing in the word indispensable that says alone. And I believe the kinds of issues that are out there that have to be dealt with require partnership. So how to deal with terrorism without creating more terrorists, how to deal with nuclear proliferation, how to deal with the issues uh, that are energy, environment, global pandemics, how to deal with the growing gap between the rich and the poor require us to have partners. And I believe that the Chinese, uh, if they look at uh, those issues that I mentioned, uh, also have an interest in dealing with them. And so I think in a spirit of partnership to try to keep the world um, that we have a natural way of working together. First question from Grand Rapids. Dixie, China has commented on the dysfunction of our government with respect to our budget process and debt ceiling debate. How do you think this might impact the economic relationship between the two countries? I have to say, I, I recently had a discussion with a Chinese official, and he asked me, so what is going on in your country? And I explained that we have a two-party system, and we argue in the open. They have a one-party system, and they argue underneath that umbrella. And basically, I think that in many ways, arguments are useful. Compromise is more important. I do think that um, the Chinese are looking at us in terms of what is going on. However, the government is functioning. Uh, there are discussions going on on our economic relationship. And, um, and ultimately, I think the Chinese do recognize also that we are uh, the power that we are and that we will get our act together. From Twitter, and Peter from the University of Pittsburgh, Obama's pivot to Asia and China's military rise are feeding mutual distrust. Is there a way out? I think what's interesting on the rebalancing to Asia is it depends on uh, who is talking about it. I think that there is a group uh, in China and a group in the United States that does see kind of military threats from each other. And the Chinese believe that we are trying to contain them. Um, and we believe, uh, some of the those that advocate this more robust view, that the Chinese are moving out and uh, have aircraft carriers and um, submarines and that they are a threat. I think that there's another part to this, which is that we do, as I mentioned in my remarks, have many issues in common that we should be trying to uh, work together on. The problem is that if you only listen to those that are uh, suspicious of the relationship, it kind of becomes a vicious circle. Anne in Beijing via Twitter asks, at Sunnylands we saw a new type of U.S.-China communication, no scripted talking points. That is, seems to me essential to building trust and cooperation. Can it continue? One would hope so. I think one of the hard parts about any official meeting, officials are always handed talking points, and I will very much remember a real discussion that I had with the Chinese Foreign Minister Chen Chi Chen at the time, and I said, here are my talking points, give me your talking points, and let's have a strategic discussion. And I do think that the kind of discussion that the two presidents had the No Necktie Summit, as it was known, I think did help to build uh, a relationship between these two leaders. But ultimately, uh, we are going to have to work across the whole board of our government and theirs in order to build that relationship. From Orion at the Middlebury College venue, what do you view as the most significant debate within the U.S. foreign policy community with respect to China policy and what are your personal views with respect to that debate? I think that the debate um, is one basically as to how much of um, our debt and our economy is dependent on Chinese activities. So it, I think to a great extent it's an economic discussion. 
Um, we obviously want to have a balanced trading relationship with the Chinese, and we want to have jobs created. Um, we need their, we like their market, we need their market. So I think mostly looking at it from both angles in terms of those who favor more economic relationship with the Chinese, they see it positively than those who fear the relationship that the Chinese are taking advantage of us. So that is the base, the, the largest part of the relationship. And then um, there also are strategic issues in terms of, um, as I mentioned earlier, a, a real desire to have China have a global role. Uh, will they take advantage of that global role uh, because they're energy hungry uh, and they need resources? And so is what they're doing abroad more a resource hunt than global partnership? So it's a complicated relationship. I think one of the things that uh, one always says in diplomacy when there are many issues that it's a multifaceted relationship. So we do have this multifaceted relationship with the Chinese. This is Chris from Baltimore. It could be said that the U.S. and China are investing in emerging markets based on divergent models. How can our two nations work together in these areas? I think it, the, meaning this is an AID model. Their aid, Chinese aid model and our aid model are quite different. Well, I think that that's true, and it's kind of what I alluded to in, in the previous answer. We give, uh, we are a generous country, and we do give assistance in a variety of ways, we often condition it in some way, uh, that we want to see certain changes in having the rule of law or commercial codes or democracy. And the Chinese basically give grants. Um, and I, I was um, uh, in a country in Africa not long ago, and there were discussions about whether a road should be built uh, through uh, one of the wild uh, areas where the animals are. And we had all kinds of environmental regulations, and the Chinese came and said, where do you want it? <laughs> so there is a difference. And some of, I, th I think it does make some people nervous in terms of how quickly the Chinese go into a country. And the uh, one, the aid issues, but also the kind of um, um, deals that they make. So I, my views here generally are that I, we need to have a really much more expanded relationship with the Chinese, but we don't have to accept everything that they do. Uh, and we have our role as we discuss what American national interests are. This is Doug without a venue. Do you think the current crackdown on media, academics, and others in China will continue? And if so, should the U.S. confront China about these restrictions? Well, let me say always, uh, in this multifaceted relationship that I mentioned, there was not a time that I didn't meet with the Chinese that I didn't raise issues that had to do with human rights and religious freedom and various um, academic issues or whatever are very much our core values. One has to do this. I think that it, uh, when you have a relationship and you're developing a friendship, you have to be frank. And we don't do any favors, certainly to our people or theirs, if we don't talk about these things. So I wouldn't ever pull any punches on these issues. I think that is the, the normal standard for American uh, diplomats and leaders. And I think that we have to keep stating what we believe in. Uh, and the Chinese people are hearing it more and more. We have to be true to the core values that we profess and respond to their questions about what we're doing. Uh, in a in a frank and honest way. Mm -hmm. This is via Twitter from Clifton. The U.S. invited the Chinese Navy to participate in RIMPAC 2014, joint naval exercises in the Pacific that include many of China's neighbors. How will this impact U.S.-Japan relations? Well, this is one of the more complex issues, and part of it does have to do with the fact that the Chinese Navy is expanding. They ha are developing a blue water Navy, and we are recently reading about new submarines that they have. Um, and we are concerned generally about some of the aspects of expansion of the Chinese um, in the South China Sea, East China Sea. But one of the issues that is out there is specifically uh, the Sino-Japanese relationship. And 
uh, the conflicts that they're already having about certain islands, um, we have a, a treaty of alliance with the Japanese. And um, we will obviously continue to make that very clear. But it does not preclude us from having exercises with other countries. But I think it, it's very clear to people that there is a concern about what is going on between China and Japan, potentially uh, nervous making. This is Jim from Madison, Wisconsin. With China holding such a large portion of our debt, is the U.S. at particular risk vis-a-vis -vis diplomatic relations? By the way, I think China holds less than 10 percent. So the basis of that yeah. question may... Um, well, I, clearly, I think that this, you know, on a previous question when um, you asked, you know, what is the major subject of discussion, it is this economic issue. and who is dependent upon whom. There is no question that we are, have a symbiotic relationship on the economic issues. Uh, the Chinese do hold a portion of our debt. They need us for their markets. Um, and so it is very much not a subject that's apart from diplomacy. And that the talks that we have with the Chinese are on a strategic level and an economic level and a number of aspects that all go together in this multifaceted relationship from Patrick O'Connor in one of our Massachusetts venues. Do you believe China's emerging involvement in Africa and the Mideast will harm U.S.-China relations in the coming decades? I think that um, the question is whether we operate in a way where some of our uh, approaches in other um, emerging markets or other areas are complementary or competitive. And again, I think it's very hard to have a generalization there. I think in some areas we have um, complementary aspects of trying to figure out what to do. Um, and in others, uh, we are competitors. And some of this has to do with the Chinese style of just doing grants or deals uh, um, and, and really going into countries where they are searching for resources. So. Um, potentially, I think that there may be some um, really competitive aspects to it. Um, and this is the, the real question as to how diplomatically you handle developing a relationship where we want to see them take some global responsibility, at the same time being somewhat nervous about mm -hmm. some of the things they do. How do you think about, as our energy independence approaches and our reliance on Mideast oil, becomes virtually nil by 2020. How do you see the U.S.-China relationship playing out in the Mideast in that context, where China is becoming heavily reliant on Mideast oil, the U.S. is becoming independent of Mideast oil, yet our Navy protects those sea lanes? Well, I think um, there are obviously changes in the energy picture, but I personally have never believed that our only interest in the Middle East is over oil. Uh, we have a strategic interest in the Middle East. Uh, we will, uh, I believe, have a presence of some kind there uh, for the foreseeable future. Um, I do think also in the oil story, the United States, even if we do become energy independent, are concerned about global oil prices. Uh, so it isn't as if we're just completely out of the oil story. And also, um, the Chinese may behave in a different way if they need the oil out of the Middle East in terms of helping promote stability. I think the bottom line is we don't quite know yet, uh, but I, I do believe that we are not totally abandoning the Middle East in order to have either the Russians or the mm -hmm. Chinese take it over. Yeah. Does it clearly, but does it require rebalancing of our kind of activities in the Mideast. Well, you know what's interesting is I was asked a question after the, um, so somebody said to me, so what do you think about President Obama's rebalancing to Asia, and what are you going to do about West Asia? And I thought, what is West Asia? Well, West Asia is the Middle East, so uh, <laughs> we are not out of there completely, and I think that the United States is a country uh, that does have global responsibilities, and we are not just going to abandon certain areas. From Colby College. What's your opinion about the strict restriction towards Tibetans and foreigners going into Tibet and its effect on the issues between China and Tibet and other minority groups? 
I have always been troubled about what has been going on between the Chinese uh, and the Tibetans and what has happened in Tibet. I think this is one of the issues that is always raised in diplomatic um, con conversations of all kinds and uh, the restrictions in terms of uh, how the Tibetans are treated and then access to Tibet itself. So I think it is one of the more troubling aspects and I also think we simply have to speak out when something uh, akin to uh, what is really isolating a, a, a very important area of the world or where people's rights are not uh, honored. We have to speak out about it and I've never agreed with people who have thought that the U.S.-Chinese relationship is so important that you don't raise those issues. You have to raise those issues on a regular basis. This is from Baton Rouge at LSU. Should we expect China to take on the role of peacekeeper in the future? If so, then will China operate under UN auspices or at its own, as its own peacekeeping entity? I would, that's the question I would note. I believe China has over 2,000 peacekeepers yeah. operating under UN auspices presently. What is interesting is um, that the, there was a time that peacekeeping operations before the end of the Cold War that the permanent members of the Security Council usually did not take part in them. The peacekeeping operations have changed a lot. Uh, we did a lot in the 90s to kind of look at how they should be operating in a post-Cold War uh, scenario. And the Chinese now do have, as you mentioned, um, over a thousand peacekeepers, and they do operate within the UN mandates. So uh, that is something that has changed. What was interesting when I was at the UN was that um, the Chinese did not really like to participate in a lot of international discussions. Uh, they mostly abstained on votes, um, and it was part of, you know, were they really global partners in anything, mm -hmm. because they really didn't participate. They now are, in fact, participating in peacekeeping, and from everything that I know, they do abide by the UN mandates, um, and they, uh, they do contribute. They contribute actually more troops than we do at this point. Yes. This is, again, don't know the venue. George, how should the United States react to China's territorial claims in the South China Sea, as well as potential energy independence from claims in the South China Sea? Uh, generally, I think that um, there is concern about what the Chinese activities are in the South China Sea and competition over certain islands um, with some of our allies. And uh, the fact that uh, they want to deal with these issues on a bilateral basis, whether it's with the Philippines or Vietnam or Japan, and we believe that there needs to be some kind of international structure uh, that allows there to become kind of rules of the road for the area. Um, in various meetings that I've participated in, this is very much a subject on people's minds. Um, and one that is worrisome, not just in the Chinese-Japanese relationship, but with our other um, allies in the region. Um, and, um, and I think people are concerned. They're also concerned about an accident that could happen, that some fishing vessels are there and there could be a ramming or something that happens, and that there's not a, a system of kind of hotlines or anything that would make sure that, that so an accident might not escalate mm -hmm. into something worse. So the bottom line is people are concerned about it. There's no question. And some of it has to do with resources, and some of it just has to do with a territorial expansion. But I think of the various areas that concern people in our relationship with China, that one is right up there. Mm -hmm. This is a th uh, an interesting question from Roro in New Haven, Connecticut. With our growing economic stratification, can the United States learn from China's rapidly growing income gap, or will it be the other way around? I can't see that we would learn on this. I, I, we obviously have very different systems, and, um, and I think that they have not dealt very well with their income gap. That's what I have found interesting. For a one-party state, uh, they have gaps between the rich and the poor, uh, also between urban and rural, um, and so um, uh, I think we have more to teach them, but they aren't really 
looking at our system for teaching. Uh, but I, I do not think that, that we could learn much from a one-party state. Let's see. Sar at the University of Pittsburgh. University of Pittsburgh has asked the most questions yeah. today. What programs, if any, is China developing to address the issue of air pollution, especially in Beijing? Before this program started, you, in fact, mentioned visiting right. Beijing when the air was dense with pollution and fog. Well, I, I think unless you've been there, um, or, I mean, it's much worse than even looking at pictures in our newspapers or on TV. Uh, you can't see out the window of your hotel, and, uh, you know, it looks like it's dark in the middle of the day. They have tried various things. They managed to deal with things during the Olympics in terms of uh, having alternate driving days and a variety of different things. I do think that there has been a step forward in terms of the agreement that uh, President Obama and President Xi reached on some um, um, rules on, on uh, emissions. Um, and the question is to what extent the Chinese will live up to what they're doing and move away from coal. Uh, but they, they know what their problems are. Right. I mean, um, and, and my own sense from being there is that people, they cannot go into, um, I mean, they are the world's second largest economy, but how they're going to, they can't do it in this particular way. There's no question. And they have to figure out a way to deal with it. Hmm. Fewer cars or emissions, but they know they've got a problem. Yeah, it was interesting to see that the Chinese government today announced that they're going to be studying the link between this pollution and health issues. Yeah. That then it's a tough admission to make, I have to say, though <laughs> there, when you can't breathe or see, ultimately you have to do something. Judy in Iowa, could you comment on U.S. concerns over Chinese cyber spying and Chinese concerns over U.S. monitoring of everything and everyone? Well, I, obviously this is the issue of the day. Uh, we have been concerned about what the Chinese have been doing in the cyber area, and primarily I'm going to say something again. Countries do spy on each other. You know, I think that um, it is what has happened for uh, hundreds of years. Um, but there are different kinds of uh, there when you're looking at national security issues. Kind of how do you, what does one country have in its military, et cetera? Those are the kinds of things that have gone on. What are troubling now is what people kind of call economic, the spying, uh, stealing intellectual property of uh, basically espionage economically, especially when because the Chinese have state-owned enterprises and so it's kind of how they operate, who gets the benefits from it. Um, and um, the Chinese, I think, we need to establish some whole new way of trying to figure out how we deal in the cyber age uh, because we don't have any rules of the road. <clears throat> and I think as the issues have come out in the United States and other places, uh, there needs to be a, a discussion of this and establishing some rules. But, but basically, what we have objected to is the um, uh, cyber espionage <clears throat> in the industrial area. Right. Um, George, again, it doesn't say the venue. How do you feel that China will balance expenditures on military growth with expenditure on looming health care costs associated with an aging population? I think that one of the things I, I have to say whenever I go to China and you think about the size of the country and their problems uh, and how they deal uh, with the discrepancies and the divisions within their own society and that they don't like to admit that they're going on, I think that they do have to figure out that they have an aging population mostly supported by one child as a result of the One China policy. Um, and at the same time have to do with issues in terms of do they want to expand their military, how much, uh, and they, uh, as any country, are trying to figure out the balance. They have a hard time. This is a huge population that as many problems as the United States has uh, at this moment, they are not anywhere near the kinds of issues that the Chinese have to deal with, and I think we are more honest in terms of admitting where our problems are. So that is something that they have to sort out. This is from Frank, who's at the DePaul University venue in Chicago. 
how will China's investments in Latin America, a lot closer to home than Africa and the Mideast, affect its relationship with the United States? Well, again, I think we are um, watching very carefully. I think that um, one of, I remember when I was in office, I went down to the Panama Canal and um, watching Chinese ships there was something that made people nervous. And then there are other places where we um, feel that this is uh, the Western Hemisphere. Uh, but I think we have to get used to the fact that the Chinese, we can't have it both ways. We, if we want them to be partners or play a global role of responsibility, they're going to be global. And the best thing about the United States is we are innovative. Uh, we have a democracy. We know how to respect other countries. Um, and so I, I am not afraid of the competition, but we have to get our act back together and also uh, give a, uh, a real leg up to those who have innovative ideas. We've talked about now Latin America, Asia, the Mideast, and Africa. How about investment in the United States? What do you think the implications of that are for the relationship? Well, I, I think actually um, there is no, we should welcome uh, investments in the United States, depending upon in what area it is. But I think that there are certain places where we want to see Chinese investment uh, that create jobs uh, <clears throat> that uh, help us in a number of ways. So I, it depends on the investment, but I really do think uh, that for the most part, people want to see uh, Chinese investment in the United States. Yeah. From Andrew, asked this via Twitter, do you think that Nixon and Kissinger's real, real politic approach to China is the most effective one? Well, it's interesting. It certainly worked. Uh, <laughs> um, and, and as I met Nixon and Kissinger did open China up. Um, I have uh, finally gotten my way through Kissinger's book on, on China. Um, and it's fascinating in terms of the way that all uh, was laid out and worked. I think that. Uh, we have other, as I mentioned in my remarks, other presidents of the United States have followed up on a right. relationship with China. Uh, I think we do have to do it with eyes open, but the bottom line is we cannot forget about our value system. And I really do think it's essential when Americans go to China that we can't um, kind of, uh, uh, some apologize for various parts. I, I mean, I believe in democracy, and I also think that ultimately the Chinese would be more stable if they allowed um, more um, openness and had the capability of listening to some of their uh, smart people in terms of ideas they have about the evolution of Chinese politics. This earpiece is telling me we have 20 seconds left, but I want to thank you for what I could only describe as a tour de force in the U.S.-China relationship yeah. in these descriptions. As promised, I've heard Secretary Albright do this before, and she has done it spectacularly tonight. So thank you so much for being with us. And to all of our venues, enjoy the speakers that you have. Learn as much as you can about China. And if you want to visit us, you can visit us at ncuscr.org. Thank you for being with us. Thank, Thank you, you for the honor. I enjoyed it tremendously. Thank, Thank you. you.